jump into it? Yeah, yeah. go for it. No. Okay. Uh, so this is the third episode of the Hashtag Never Alone podcast. I'm the host, Jordan Harbinson, uh, and due to COVID restrictions, I am lucky enough to actually have my co-host, Joe Ambridge, who is actually the director of this amazing podcast, uh, and we get to have him coming along and asking our guests some questions. So we are going to be focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder for this episode, which is also more commonly known as PTSD. Basically, PTSD is a series of um, reactions, like a set of reactions that people may um, develop after going through quite a um, traumatic experience, which could be something um, like a natural disaster, um, an accident, like a car accident. Um, they could be experiencing a physical or a sexual assault scenario. And it is, I guess, most commonly known uh, with people that have been to war and been in those types of situations. Um, so basically it's, it's the um, situation may um, present people with like the feeling of intense fear or helplessness um, or even actually horror. So that these are the feelings that actually bring about the PTSD. About 70% of adults or well, people will go through a traumatic situation in their lives. Then 20% of those people would generally develop PTSD. There's about 8 million people um, in a year that would be experiencing um, PTSD and one in 13 adults would develop it in their lifetime. So we are going to jump over to Joe, who is going to introduce our first guest. Uh, um, yeah, sorry about the art webcam. Um, yeah, so our first guest is Mark Fielding. He's a close friend of mine. I used to work with Mark. Um, I've done other projects with Mark, such as Anxious Me Too and Psychotherapy Unfogged. We will link in the description for the video. And yeah, so Mark, just tell us a little bit about yourself, What's your background. Yeah, sure. I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist and a relationship counsellor. I've been in practice for about 15 years, um, working from kind of various clinics in London and now obviously working remotely on Zoom with all of my clients. Yeah, I had a fair bit of experience with, you know, with clients presenting with PTSD and trauma and, you know, just saying really like your introduction, Jordan, because I think the distinction is often not made. I think when people talk about PTSD, they assume like it's people coming back from war, you know, and of course it is that, you know, but people can experience PTSD around everyday situations, you know, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. So it's quite a wide spectrum, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> just also wanted to acknowledge that we do have um, another guest who's Jason Shears. Is that how I pronounce that, Jason? Shears, but yeah, it's close. <laughs> okay. So, well, I was looking at it and I was like, I'm sure it's not as easy as this looks. Um, but you'll be our lived experience guest. So we'll, we'll jump back to you, but I just wanted to acknowledge that you are in the Zoom room, I guess. Um, and at any point, like if anyone wants to jump in, it's just a bit of an open forum discussion um, around this. Um, but yeah, back to you, Joe. Uh, yeah, so Mark, uh, well, I've worked with Mark, he's helped me a few of my mental health issues. So I know him very well and I know he's very good at what he does. Um, anyway, so I just want to ask you, Mark, what you can tell us about PTSD, what can cause it, um, what does it stem from? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll interchange maybe trauma and PTSD because um, PTSD, I think, is, you know, the consequence of, you know, experiencing like a trauma kind of in the present. Yeah, I mean, PTSD, you know, can be caused. It, it, generally, it's a feeling of kind of helplessness. It's, it's not expecting something. So, you know, maybe walking across the road, you know, and kind of being you know, knocked over by a car. You know, there's something around the, the kind of helplessness, the, the not being, you know, in a position where you're expecting something to happen that I think, you know, creates a situation where PTSD is more likely to happen. Um, I mean, PTSD can also be caused by things like bullying. I mean, I've worked a lot with, child, with clients presenting with childhood bullying, you know, and PTSD, you know, can often be present, you know, for, for kind of people that have experienced these early, you know, traumas. Um, yeah. Okay, so just um, just thought it was interesting to mention on the childhood side of things because obviously we are speaking with adults on this podcast and 
a lot of the data that we'd find, I guess, would be more about adults and, and their experiences and things. Um, and I thought that that was interesting, like with the, yeah, that children, I mean, obviously they've got brains and they go through experiences and things like that. So this is something that they can suffer from as well. Yeah, sure. And I guess it's the, it's the, it's the difficulty with processing you know, I mean, years ago, you know, Freud talked about like a war neurosis. You know, this was maybe the early kind of idea, you know, around what is now PTSD. Um, and yeah, it, it is just something happening where we're kind of helpless to prevent it. So, you know, we have absolutely no control and something traumatic happens to us, you know. And then I think our mind just tries to process it. You know, I mean, kind of symptoms of PTSD, you know, would, would, would generally be the mind keeps coming back to the trauma. You know, every time it comes back to the trauma, it will bring up all the traumatic feelings that perhaps, you know, weren't, weren't processed at the time. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I think the mind does this because it, it's wanting to process it, you know, but I think for the individuals that have experienced trauma, you know, it's really, really distressing. You know, insomnia, you know, anxiety, and, and a kind of numbing out. You know, often people, you know, really, really numb out. You know, so they kind of live their lives and then the numbing out, I guess, is a kind of coping strategy for all of the kind of bad feelings that are inside. You know, but I think people that have experienced PTSD, that they often find living a kind of a normal life really tough. Mm -hmm. and, and would that be your experience across the board with PTSD, whether it be from like a, you know, a toxic relationship or a really bad car accident, is it still the same type of symptoms that would present in, in people just trauma across the board? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, I guess I have to put in a caveat, you know, everyone is so individual. So any, anything that happens to any of us, you know, is kind of filtered through the lens of our own, you know, learned experience and, you know, experience kind of childhood and stuff. But I think the numbing out, I mean, in my experience, you know, the people that I've worked with, yeah, the numbing out, I think, is, you know, seems to be really, really common, you know, and the interrupted sleep, you know, the, the anxiety created when, you know, this trauma keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be really, really common amongst you know, people that have experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. So when, when you've got people um, that are coming to you, you know, do... Do people often, um, would they distinguish that that suffering of the trauma themselves when they're like, hey, doctor, I really need some assistance. I've got PTSD. Or, you know, what, yeah, what's your experience with the diagnosis side of things? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, in my experience, rarely. I, th I think rarely people understand what's happening to them. You know, I mean, this could be, this could, they could come and something could have happened last week, right? But generally people will come, you know, where they've been disturbed with these kind of feelings for a long, long time. And, you know, even identifying it for, for you know, a lot of clients as kind of PTSD is really helpful because people mm -hmm. have all these symptoms and they've probably lived with them for years and they don't really understand what's going on. So mm -hmm. you know, just that, you know, the kind of diagnosis can be really, really helpful for some people. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, I think that that's a, a lot of the case with, any type of mental illness or, you know, difficulty that people are struggling with. I mean, for myself to, you know, when people kind of, you have a chat with someone and they say, you know, the words and it can kind of make a bit more sense. You're like, okay, I'm not an, an absolute crazy person. What I'm going through has a name and it can be like, there are things to work on and like to make it better. Yeah. I mean, like you say, you know, I mean, this is applicable kind of across the board, normalizing it. I think can be really helpful and mm -hmm. then people can understand that you know there's not it's not something wrong with them you know often people that are experiencing kind of mental health conditions feel there's you know there's something wrong with them it's just them you know and I guess providing a bit of context can be really helpful you know mm -hmm. and it can also help people you know to maybe go and see their GP you know if medication is helpful for them then they can kind of seek out some medication support mm -hmm. groups are also really good I think for PTSD so mm -hmm. I guess the, the diagnosis can be really, really helpful and then people mm -hmm. can kind of take further steps on the back of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think, you know, it's first thing is acknowledging that there's a problem and then, yeah, putting steps into place as to how you can do that. Um, and like I said, we will jump over to Jason shortly to be able to have, like, that's why we have a lived experience guest on the show to 
be able to just see a, a small viewpoint of what someone else has experienced. But you did mention a couple of um, techniques there, like joining a support group or being, you know, medication. We have spoken about that on the show um, before. What would your um, coping, your, I guess, yeah, the top recommended coping strategies that you would recommend them with? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I guess I have to preface it by saying it depends on the individual. You yes. know, different coping strategies, you know, are going to work differently for different people. But, you know, mm-hmm. I think with, with PTSD, you know, often the threat system is on. So this kind of fight or flight system that we have, you know, so if we perceive a threat, the fight or flight system comes on, you know, and that system's there to help us, to help us deal mm-hmm. with the trauma. But I think often with PTSD, it, it remains on. And so, you know, sufferers can, you know, depending on the trauma they've experienced, can be seeing threat everywhere. You know, the threat system is on. You know, part of the threat system is the amygdala. It's like part of the brain. It's like fire alarm. So when there's a potential threat, this part of the brain just, just is off. You know, it's, it's, it's sending signals. It's ringing. You know, yeah. and, and that's fine. You know, it's good. It's helpful. But I think with people with PTSD, it tends to be on a lot of the time. So, you know, coping strategies, I think, you know, should involve things to calm down the threat system. Mm-hmm. So, so just to kind of, if I use maybe a metaphor around traffic lights, so, you know, so if the, when the threat system is on, traffic lights red, right, everything's going on, you know, there's lots of physiological arousal. So bringing in a coping strategy, I think, to, to bring the person down to green and uh, to, to amber and then to green you know, to calm their system, I think is really, really helpful, really, really helpful for them in their own lives, really, really helpful, I think, as part of the therapeutic process. Things like mindfulness, I think, are really, really good. Meditation, Mm -hmm. although that's not a quick fix, but all of these things, I think, can be used just to kind of calm that threat system. You know, physical exercise, you know, as with, I think, most mental health, you know, disorders, really, really helpful grounding techniques i think are really good you know and also i think as part of the therapy going back to the trauma and re well, not re-experiencing it but kind of processing it retrospectively and then you know after that processing being able to put the trauma back into the story of me mm-hmm. so kind of looking back and understanding that the trauma was there but being able to look at it a little bit more objectively i think is also really important you know mm-hmm. and i think some people medication can be really helpful in the short term you know yeah. give them medication you know ad's antidepressants can you know can help put pe- people put a little bit distance between the trauma and all the feelings that come up from it you know and you know exploring it so mm-hmm. yeah okay because i i mean for me i I'm, might have mentioned on other podcasts or, or whatnot that the medication side of things um helped when you're talking about the uh, traffic lights, if I was at a, a red um, from, you know, a borderline personality disorder episode, the, by taking the antidepressants, it allowed me to not get to red so quickly. And then in an am- like in that amber state, once I could start processing my thoughts logically, then I could get back down to green kind of by myself. But that, that was just, you know, what, what helped for me. And, um, a question that I had was, have you heard about EMDR therapy for trauma? Yeah. I mean, I don't do EMDR, but apparently EMDR is really, really effective for trauma. So I've got to say two weeks, (laughs) my first one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a, there's a, there's a guy who's a kind of the go-to guy around trauma at the moment. I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong. (laughs) So I apologize in advance, but it's Bessel van der Volk. And uh, he's written a load of stuff, you know, really fantastic, in my opinion, you know, on yeah. trauma. And, um, oh, actually, I've forgotten your question. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this is EMDR. Yeah, EMDR, yeah. And, and you know, he's an EMDR practitioner, and uh, he, he thinks it's really, really effective. So I think EMDR for trauma is meant to be a really, really good treatment. Yeah, okay, cool. Because um, it's for people think and we'll put some links and stuff in the in the bottom but um it's like the the eye movement um kind of like it's my gran has had it my 78 year old grandma she's done some emdr um because she went to a psych and realized that she has actually gone through a lot of traumatic events and often we don't like recognize them 
like there's either like this mentality I'm sure that you will come across of people especially with mental health stuff in general as well that people are just like okay yep that's happened and we're just going to move on because i don't have time to dwell on that we're just going to move forward and you can actually stack up a bunch of traumatic stuff that you actually haven't dealt with over a lifetime so my grand said that it's it has helped her with some of the things and being able to like you said put it back in your story not it's not mind erasal that you've forgotten that this bad things happened to you but it's not affecting you in such a you know emotional way yeah and there's something about you know as i say my knowledge of emdr is is not deep but there's something about the processing it's meant to really help the brain kind of process you know these traumas and when you talk about the, the stacking up jordan i mean i think this this often happens for people you know i guess when i first started practicing i guess i was surprised that there's trauma everywhere you know mm-hmm. i mean people experience trauma you know in all sorts of walks of life you know they you know a lot of people experience trauma you know in their lives basically and the stacking up you know there's a, there's a concept called complex ptsd where there's more than one trauma or there's an extended period you know of trauma like if someone's experiencing domestic violence for instance you know that would be probably complex ptsd you know mm-hmm. and, and the coping strategy of just kind of numbing out you know disassociating from it if you like and then just getting on with with your life you know i mean that's a that's an okay coping strategy and i guess people that are not in therapy that this is the way they deal with it but you know the problem with that is you know the trauma just sits there you know mm-hmm. and it affects people and it kind of spills out and you know disturbs people because it's not dealt with mm-hmm. okay so did you have any other questions joe for mark at the moment yeah um as someone obviously me and mark are both work with people with learning disabilities um is PTSD quite common with people with learning disabilities at all um i, I would say people with people with learning difficulties there's probably a lot of trauma yeah, yeah. i mean um you know again i'm you know i've worked with kind of adults with learning difficulties in a different context so i'm not an expert but 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 my guess would be that there's probably a lot of pd ptsd there's probably a lot of grief you know, there's yeah. probably a lot of, I don't know, trauma around, I don't know, how others engage with people, with adults with learning difficulties. You know, I, I think probably often with, you know, with people, you know, with, with underneath that umbrella, it's others, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's I've, how others treat them that I think can cause trauma. I've noticed that a lot of people with PTSD or trauma is caused quite a lot with people learning disabilities. It's caused uh, selective mutism or mutism where people don't speak, obviously, or choose not to speak because of what's happened in their life from trauma. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would guess that that would be true. You know, and also, I guess if, I mean, you know, it's a big umbrella, isn't it? You know, adults with learning difficulties, you know, it's a, it's a big spectrum of, you know, kind of different people, you know, and different kind of, you know, attributes. But, but I guess the difficulty in processing it is probably there. You know, if somebody, you know, has, you know, communication difficulties, you know, and that's not true of all adults with learning difficulties in any way, shape or form, but the ability to process it and the ability to put it into a, you know, into a kind of joined up story of me, I think is really difficult. Yeah. You know, also people, people around them, you know, one would always hope that, you know, people around adults with learning difficulties are, are going to be there, going to be supportive, you know, but sadly, that's not always the case. So the trauma yeah. probably just sits there. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, you know, like you said, trauma is everywhere. So it just depends on how, how what experiences people come across it yeah everyone has their own kind of um you know trials and tribulations and stuff like that and you know there's a percentage of those people that will struggle to get over what they've experienced so yeah yeah and and the, you know the complex nature of it you know like Jordan, the joining up of it i think is really important you know someone's experienced something like say like i don't know attachment trauma you know, maybe there's been something going on in the parenting that perhaps wasn't perfect, you know, and so, you know, difficult for, you know, a a child to really kind of process that. It's just kind of normal. And then perhaps they go to school and then something happens, they get bullied at school and then they go to the workplace and then something happens or then perhaps they're involved in an accident, you know, and all of these traumas all link up 
you know, and it's incredibly difficult for people, I think, you know, and, and, and then I think, you know, they need to maybe, you know, take some medication, go into therapy, but, you know, but like, like you say, trauma's everywhere. People experience mm -hmm. trauma all the time. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I, I thought that that would be a good segue into jumping into Jason um, saying that trauma is everywhere. So we do have a lived experience, um, you know, guest to be able to hopefully give us a, a little bit of an insight into what his journey has been with it. So uh, Jason, we'll, we'll jump over to you. And if you want to give us a bit of an overview as to how how you've you've come across uh this podcast and and why you're wanting to be a part of it at this stage yeah <clears throat> uh just checking how much time have we got uh it should carry uh, on because i've got an uh, extra 40 minutes because from my last chat <laughs> okay oh, yeah. Cool. um yeah i mean i just i was i was interested in sharing my experience um the <clears throat> You know, it's interesting listening because I spent a lifetime in the psychological world of therapies, you know, and, and sort of getting treatments and trying everything, you know, to recover from my own experience uh, without much, you know, without much help, really. Um, you know, my trauma was that my dad went out one day, he was killed in an accident um, when I was young, when I was a young boy, you know. So it's like, um, you know, and from there, it was just a lifetime of escape from a very young age of, um, you know, having food addictions, um, addictions to money, to crime, to stealing, you know, I was just completely off key, off the rails. Um, so to getting into the world of addiction, you know, drug addiction and crime, you know, being held up at gunpoint, being attacked with a machete, you know, having multiple different traumatic events, you know, like, uh, all piling on top of each other. Um, you know, by the time I was in late teens, you know, I was in a, I was in a mess with um, crime and drug addiction and going to jail. You know, I was pretty much up, on the tracks for um, destruction, for self-destruction. Um, it, yeah, it was pretty horrific, to be honest. You know, it was kind of like it was. Um, it was. Um, you know, it was just like an existence rather than a life, you know, and I didn't know anything different. You know, that was the thing, you know, it's kind of, I've been sent to psychiatrists. I've been given mental health diagnoses, you know, of, of, or, and, and given medication. From nine years old, I was given medication. I was given my first antidepressant at nine, you know, it's kind of, um, and, and from then on, I was sent to a special secure unit, special, took out of school and put into special schools. Um, you know, and, until I just got to the point of being uncontrollable. I left home as a young teenager. You know, I lived in caravans. I lived in cars. I lived in pit on people's sofas. Um, you know, and, and life just didn't look like it was um, it was ever going to come together. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, to sort the of peak of it, you know, was being in jail. You know, multiple times for for committing crime, for drugs. You know, being a heroin addict and uh, and just escaping from life and. Um, you know, complete disconnection with family, complete disconnection with everyone, with the world, you know, with, that, with no real sense of reality, um, apart from the experience that I was having of life, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I got clean when I was 23, so I stopped taking drugs when I was 23. I went to rehab, you know, and, change, and sort of changed my life from then, but, um, which was over 25 years ago, but, you know, um, I wasn't happy. You know, that was the thing. You know, I'd found recovery. I'd found freedom from taking drugs and committing crime to some extent, you know, but like certainly clean. And um, so I went on a journey. You know, I was, I was, a, I was a spiritual searcher, you know, an, a, an eternal searcher for something, you know, to change my experience of life. I stopped taking drugs, but became obsessed with relationships, gambling, sex, money, um, anything really, you know, it was kind of like, it was like there was a, a huge void inside. And even though like a lot of the um, experiences that I had in the you know, psychiatric specialist expert type world, you know, it's kind of like, there was never any real mention of grief or trauma or anything like that. I mean, the, it was so misunderstood looking at my medical history which i've got in recent years from when i was a kid you know because you can do that in the uk you can apply back for your whole 
medical history, looking at some of the psychiatric reports, you know, they were quite comical, really, to, to what people understood as what was what was going on for me versus my own series of events. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, I continued to search, you know, that's how I, that's how I ended up training as a therapist. You know, I, I've got um, a long list of credentials, you know, I've, done, I've got a master's degree in, in transactional analysis. Uh, qualified as a person centered therapist, qualified in NLP, qualified in CBT. You know, I, I did all these things. I spent 10 years in therapy. Um, and none of it helped, to be honest. You know, it's kind of like that there was, you know, lots of different offers of medication and different things, you know, it's kind of like, but really, you know, I was always unhappy. I always felt like I was looking for something. I always felt like I was escaping from something, you know, and I used to describe, um, you know, meanwhile, in that time, I'd been working, started working with people with addiction. So I've been working with addiction for the last 20 years mm -hmm. um, on an evolve, in an evolving way. So I, as I've been on my own personal journey of understanding my own trauma, my own experience, um, you know, I've been working with people alongside that, you know, so I've had a practice, you know, I've worked, you know, I work in the, I work in the field as well, I work with um, people with mental health and addictions, you know. Um, so what happened for me was, it was funny because um, when I went through my training as a therapist, which was, which was um, five years, what I noticed about my life was it got progressively worse, you know, so I started, uh, I just got a little notification oh, there you go yeah so um what happened was my life started getting worse as i started digging into this trauma you know because my my training was experiential you know, so it was a very deep dark experience you know of training as a therapist and yeah. um what happened was my life got progressively worse you know it's kind of like i remember um I mean, I'd lived overseas, you know, I'd done all sorts of things. I'd achieved things financially, like, and, and academically in different ways. But um, I can remember, you know, like about two years into my training, going to the airport to get on a flight and, and, and sitting in the airport, just gripping onto the chair, going, oh, my God, you know, it's not, I can't get on a plane. It's not this, like, um, irrational, what I thought was irrational anxiety, you know, out of nowhere. And it was kind of like, that um, in my mind, we was going to be in the sea, you know, being eaten by sharks, you know, and stuff. And it, it was all graphic. The whole scenario was just coming to your mind out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's like literally got to this point where I had to go to the doctors and get uh, medication every time before I got on a flight. Now, I'd been flying for years without any anxiety, you know. I mean, that's the strange thing about that, you know. It's kind of like that as I started digging into this trauma, you know, and going back and speaking about it and going back and speaking about it, you know, my life just got worse. You know, that's what happened, you know. And yeah, I'd escaped, you know, I'd escaped from uh, life, I'd escaped from feelings, escaped from emotions, escaped from the reality that I was, that I thought I was living in, you know, that's what I'd done. So it made sense that if I was kind of there digging into it, you know, week in, week out, talking about, you know, how I was feeling, what it was like being a child, you know, father, you know, what did I think about it, you know, and, and doing all that stuff that it, it brought it all up, you know, it brought it up for me, you know. And, yeah, um, that's what I was warned by my psych that once you start going into this, there is a potential that it, it can get quite difficult and, you know, yeah, dig up a lot of stuff. And if people, like, like you said, are trying to escape, the last thing you want to do is be like, great, I'm just going to jump into all my crap again. But mm -hmm. you did that. You... I you were going through that kind of, you know, if you're riding that little wave, you kind of hit the bottom a bit again, not in as when you're a teenager, but in a way that you weren't really expecting. Yeah. And I, and I just trust, you know, I, I never, at that time, you know, I never had the, I never thought to look further, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you were talking about diagnosis and stuff, you know, like I, I'm, I'm so, out of the world of diagnosis now, you know, it's kind of like that. I never thought to look further than a diagnosis. You know, I thought, well, if someone's saying that you've got PTSD and trauma and, um, you know, and you're an addict, then, you know, the diagnosis of the disease of addiction and, um, you know, the, the, 
the psychological explanation, you know, for what you're experiencing must be what it is. You know, I just thought they were real things. You know, I thought diagnoses were real things. You know, I thought they were, I didn't realize that they were just made up concepts about, about a set of behaviors and a set of symptoms that you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. you know, so I just accepted them as if like, yeah, and I, and I, and I put them on to, uh, as was said, the story of me, you know, I carried them around and it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I've got PTSD. I've got trauma. I'm an addict. I've got all these diseases, these symptoms, you know, it's kind of like, that's why, that's why I do what I do, you know, and I just never thought to explore further than that, you know, and for me, psychotherapy made all that worse, you know, because it confirmed, you know, I learned all about personality disorders I learned about diagnosis you know I, I learned about mental health and, and all and, uh, mental well, I learned about mental illness I didn't learn much about mental health you know what I realized in later life was that there's not much training on mental well-being you know there's much there's a lot there's that in fact there's none you know there's no training on how to be happy no training yeah. on how to experience peace of mind there's no ex there's no training on how to be free you know, how to experience freedom, freedom, how to be grounded, um, you know, what peace of mind is. It's all about mental illness and it's all about diagnosis, you know. So it makes sense that for me, while I went through that, you know, that, you know, I, I, I suffered with that um, extreme anxiety and depression. You know, I remember my training, my therapy, you know, saying to me, I think you're depressed. You need to get medication. And because I'd spent my life on drugs that I just thought there's no way I'm taking medication. So I'm just going to sit this out. You know, and it's literally just sat, sat it out, went through it. And my daughter was, you know, it was it was horrific. Cause my daughter was three at the time and um, she was the only light in my life. You know, she was like my my sense of connection to the world. You know, my sense of warmth, my sense of, jo my sense of joy. That was that was it. You know, everything else looked dark and gloomy. Um, and I remember, you know, when she used to stay with me, I used to go in her room expecting to find her cold every morning. You know, it was kind of like that was how dark my world was. You know, and I, I used to like reluctantly put my hand into her bed, you know, just to check. And when I could feel that sense of warmth that she was just sleeping, you know, it was like I had this um, this relate sense of relief, you know, and, and, and joy that like, oh, God, yeah, you know, it's, it's OK, you know, today's and, and, and it was like literally just getting through the days. You were kind of like in impending that something was going to happen. Like, even, so even if you just did have this one positive thing, you were just afraid that that was going to go as well. Exactly that, you know, like just that, that one sense, that one person, that one sense of joy and warmth of light, you know, in my life was kind of like going to be taken away from me. You know, it was kind of, it was, it was really like that. And uh, it was so scary, you know, because my in my head, the world was really dark, you know, and, and, and I really, you know, it was like there was a sense of impending doom. And I was always on high alert, you know, I was on high alert for everything. You know, she, she you know, I can see it in her now, you know, she's older now, but like I can see her and I was so like, I wouldn't, didn't want to let her walk down the stairs on her own. You know, I took care of her too much. You know, I didn't let her set, find her own sense of freedom because I was so sort of attached to her being okay, you know, because it, it, it was relevant to my sense of okayness at the time. Mm -hmm. um, Which I mean, like that, that can happen um, as well with a lot of um, people wanting to kind of get that control because you're obviously not, not having a lot everything's quiet so if you're like okay this is all that i've got i'm going to make sure that it's it's you know completely fine i mean that that kind of happens with a lot of people whether it's ptsd or i mean with what i deal with i like like ocd everything's in its place because i can control that and, and you know that's that's my little sense of control so can completely understand i think a lot of people will understand too i mean even toxic relationships if you're going through stuff and you're you've got a partner and they're the only thing that they, that you've got you know you'd hate for them to walk away from you and then that can kind of become a bit bit mm. damaging so yeah i think a lot of people would be able to relate to your feelings towards your daughter yeah so i mean like it's yeah it's a pretty crazy story because i think like we follow this kind of theme with the other topics of discussion that we've had on the podcast where you're, you're going through something really, really terrible. It's affecting your life. So then you go to, you finally go to speak to someone. It's not like the next day thing. You've probably thought about it for months and months and you finally go and speak to someone, you get a diagnosis, but then 
often like what you're experiencing and like what a lot of people are experiencing the psych you don't get along with or you know the medication doesn't work for you or you've gone through so much um of this journey and you and you're still feeling not right not not like yourself so like if people go what what the hell is the point of getting help in the first place like where's where where can you tell people that this is the light in the end of the tunnel or this is why it's worth going through this why is it worth exploring yourself and going on that spiritual journey at all Hmm. I think like the important point that I want to make, you know, is that, you know, like because I'd spent a lifetime searching, I'd done all those things. I mean, I remember when I, you know, when I, when I qualified as a therapist, they said like, right, you know, go and start off your practice. And I was like, oh, you know, like, I'm not good enough. I'm not ready. You know, it's kind of like, I, you know, I just can't do all those things, even though I'd been working with people for years, you know, it's kind of like, because I thought at the end of a, the end of a master's degree that I would have this sense of like okayness you know that would allow me to go out and do that you know in the world and um so I, I kept searching you know I went through I did so many different things and um I did all the Tony Robbins events I did all the coaching stuff and and um you know this had gone on for years for me you know but I still all I had was like I knew that I just felt not okay in the world you know it's kind of like I knew that like I still had a tendency to want to do things to the extreme to make me feel better if I found anything that made me feel good. You know, it's kind of like, like on the outside, I built a career, you know, I had a child, it was kind of like things got better, you know, I, took, I, I had, I'd had an eating disorder all my life, I was massively overweight, you know, I'd lost all my weight, I'd kind of had a sense of, you know, somewhat sense of self, but I was so resentful to the world, so um, bitter about my experience, so sad and so full of grief about the loss that I'd had even 30 years later, you know, it's kind of like that it still felt like, because I was, I'd still bought into the diagnosis, that's why, you know, I still, I still bought into the traditional stories about trauma, oh, it's held in the body, um, you know, you have these psychological reactions to experiences, you know, and things like that, and it's kind of like, so I was still carrying that around, and, and, you know, all of us do that, we all carry a story of me, you know, like I developed this story, I had all the conditioning and all the influence in, and all the diagnosis from the professional world, you know, that, that I carried with me. And so that was how I showed up to the world, you know, through the story of me, you know. And, um, you know, I had, a, I had an experience, you know, through the work of Sidney Banks, who was, um, who was a Scottish welder who had an enlightenment experience in the 70s, you know. And it was like um, I, was, I was listening to a guy called Michael Neal, um, and he, he was, uh, there was a thing on Hay House called The Path of Effortless Change. Now, it was only by chance, you know, that I was listening to it. And um, I just kept hearing something in it, you know. It's kind of like I just kept hearing something interesting, you know. And he said um, that all human beings are sat in the middle of mental health and they just don't know it, you know. And it was kind of like, and I thought, you know, it's just something that just, it just kind of stuck, you know, in my mind. It stuck in my mind and it was like... Um, and I was going to LA, I mean, the off chance, I went to see this guy, you know, I went and spent three days with him. And it was kind of like, I just had this amazing experience of just feeling completely free. And, you know, my life changed in that moment. In those two days, you know, my life changed unrecognizably, beyond any experience of 10 years of therapy, beyond all the training and list of credentials that I had, you know, and it was like, no longer seemed like I needed to escape from life, no longer felt like I wanted to search for anything. You know, I just had this experience of pure freedom. And I knew in that moment, like that I'd spent 10 years training in all sorts of modalities of change. You know, I had a list of credentials that just had to go away in the drawer that I just couldn't use anymore because it didn't no longer make sense to me to practice psychotherapy and take people into the past to revisit their trauma because I was free of my trauma instantly, you know, and that was many years ago. And, and it's kind of like, and I'm, I'm not that person anymore. You know, I don't have a diagnosis. I'm not, I'm, I don't have a diagnosis of anything. I'm not an addict. I'm not in recovery. I'm just free, you know? Yeah. And, like, and, and what I find now in my practices is that like in a short period of time, you know, in a few sessions, when I get people to see the truth of who they are, when I get people to see that, that they're sitting in the middle of mental health and they just don't know it, you know, I realize that 
I was creating my world. I remember one day saying to someone, you know, that um, I'd got in a car and uh, someone had driven a little bit fast and I was kind of all scared. And I said, yeah, it's because I've got trauma. It's because my dad was killed in an accident. And that's what happens when I get in a car. You know, I have this like reaction. And they said, is that true? And, and, and I don't know. I said, I don't know, you know. I said, I sat and I thought about it. And, I, and they said, well, it's true if you think it's true, you know. And, I, and I, I, I had a realization in that moment that I'd spent my whole life, like, believing the diagnosis that I had and then making it real, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, that's what I think we have a tendency to do, you know, that it's kind of that we take on this identity and, and, and like I said, you know, yeah, I've got PTSD, yeah, I'm an addict, yeah, I've got trauma, you know, and it's kind of like, and then we just start associating things that are happening with that to make it real, you know. And yeah, I, I get what you mean because, like, um, when I was with my ex and got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, um, both him and my dad actually blew it off as just like, well, that's, that's just something that everyone has. Or my dad actually said, you told the, the um, psychiatrist something to, to get him to diagnose you with that. It was, you know, yeah, they were just brushing it off as like, that's not a real thing. And I thought that with, with my ex partner that, he should speak to someone and his attitude was if I get given a diagnosis and that's that's it like I'm I'm done with that so like for me I I was you know agreeing with Mark that I would prefer to have a you know something that I can kind of work towards instead of it being like this invisible thing but I can completely understand that for some people having that title on themselves can be something that holds them back from actually like it puts you in that place it's like a little pin like yes, I've got depression and yes, I've got trauma and that's all I'm going to be for the rest of my life. So it's, it's very interesting, the two different perspectives. And like, again, everyone is different in how they, they want to tackle these issues that they're experiencing. Well, everyone's psychology is unique. You know, we're all, we're all, we're all a byproduct of our, you know, upbringing, environment, influence, experience, you know, conditioning. But what's underneath everyone's psychology is, is, innate mental health you know that's what I found that's what I found for myself you know and that's what I found for all the people that I work with that regardless of diagnosis you know regardless of experience you know that we're all we've all, we all have innate mental health you know like we must have a sense of okayness to know that we're not okay you know kind of like if it was consistently dark you know it's kind of like then it would just be normal to be dark. You wouldn't be going, it's dark. You'd have to have seen yeah. daylight to know it's dark, you know? Yeah, and the, the whole thing thing, thing. appreciation, you know, if we have winter all, all year and then summer comes out, you're like, oh, wow, the sun's amazing. Like, you know, all those things that you could take for granted if you didn't have the, the contrast of life, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So, so in order to know that you're not okay in the moment, you have to have a place of well-being in you. You know, you have to have a, a place in consciousness that knows, you know, that there's something that, that knows the difference between okay and not okay. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, when I went to see Michael Neal in LA, you know, that's kind of like where we went to, you know, it was speaking beyond the psychology, you know, yeah, there's loads of psychological concepts. There's loads of different hundreds of types of psychotherapies. There's loads of diagnosis, you know, the world's just full of diagnosis, but what's beyond that? What's the underpinning of psychology for everyone? You know, everyone is born innately healthy, you know, and we spend a lifetime getting away from that through conditioning and, and influence in different ways. And, and we make up this story of me, and we go around telling this story of me, you know, well, yeah. who, are, who are we all without the story of me? You know, we are innately healthy, you know, it's kind of like, and, and we have a lot of thinking and, and, and the, the psychological word, world diagnoses our thinking, you know, what we think we are, you know, what we make up that we are, you know, well, what's beyond that, you know, we're all innately healthy beyond that, you know, we all have a place of peace of mind, a sense of well-being, you know, and, and that was my big realization, you know, and that's, it's been life changing for me, you know, and it's been life changing for the people that I work with, you know. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, from hearing your story from where you were and, you know, to, to have um, someone like yourself, that's been working on, on it for such a long time. Like I'm just kind of getting back, uh, you know, I, I'm doing a bit of this and trauma yeah. something that I'm just realizing has been affecting me. But I agree with you that it's kind of like, 
I want to get over that. So I'm not the trauma person. It's that's, that's just something that happened. Like it's not, you don't want to be like 50 years old and be like, I experienced trauma. Like, you know, you want to heal. You want to be okay. Yeah. And all I would say is be curious. Just don't, yeah. you know, just be, that's all. And, and when I was saying that, it took me a long time to realize that everyone's journey is unique, you know? And yeah, I had to go to the depths of despair. I had to go through all the trainings to go, well, this is not it. Well, this is not it. Well, this is not it. You know, it's kind of like I'd complete, every time I completed something new, you know, a, a new psychological theory, a new training, like you were talking about MDR and different things. It's like every time I went through something like that, I was like, well, this is not it. I had to do that, but not everyone has to do that. You know, that's just because that was my journey, you know, and it's kind of like that, you know, being curious, you know, about what is, what is true, you know, what is really true. And it's kind of like, we only find out what is true by finding out what's not true, you know? And it's kind of like, is it true? You know, is it true that like I have trauma? Is it true that, uh, you know, that I am this diagnosis? Is it true? that's it you know and when I keep asking that question the answer is always no you know it's kind of like well what's beyond that you know what's beyond that and and the more that I look into you know the spiritual intelligence behind life you know who we truly are beyond our diagnosis you know it's kind of like well there's something really cool and there's something really lovely and amazing and warm and connected you know beyond that between all human beings you know beyond beyond our psychology and and that's been that's been my journey of it you know yeah well i think that that's great because i think that's a it's a real story obviously um and like i said it, it has been a bit of a theme on on the podcast that just because you take one step towards figuring out your mental health doesn't mean that it's the only step um and that it's it's not really ever a linear path it's um you know jutting out all over different directions sometimes you take a wrong turn have to go back try a different way um and it's it's good that you did go like you know we had mark speaking from more of the kind of clinical side you have even gone into that and then kind of gone to a different level so it's just to prove that no matter how you are going to go about your journey self-discovery is a huge part and that's what's gonna i think be the the big key no matter what way you go is being able to discover what's gonna work for you um Mm -hmm. and mark did you have any other um kind of comments just off the back of what jason said just a couple of little pieces like it's we've had some nice positive this is where you end up if you if you work hard um and i think we can all agree that it is it is um it is hard work, but you know, you could renovate a house or fix a car, but you know, the most hard work that you're going to put in is going to be most valuable to yourself, I think. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I guess, you know, listening to Jason talk, you know, I, I kind of agree with him. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a space in some, I mean, this may be too spiritual, but you know, I think, yeah, you know, I like with, it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think with, you know, I think with, uh, this is why I like, I think mindfulness, the meditation and again it depends on the client right you know if, if 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 a client is open to the spiritual dimension then you know then this may be more helpful but yeah i mean doing meditation practice i think we realize that there's a space under the self story and that space under the self story is our presence it's mm-hmm. it's really ourselves and and i think with the meditation practice and finding that space and sitting in that space more and more i think it can be really really helpful for for clients because yeah the story me i guess i think that's helpful to an extent but the real me i think is underneath all of that really underneath thought and i think spiritual practice can really kind of open up that space for us and i also wanted to talk about post-traumatic growth just quickly yeah I mean, yeah it really demonstrates this you know and i and i i think what's not you know, always talked about in terms of trauma is the growth that comes from it. You know, Mm. I think people that experience trauma and then move beyond it and process it, you know, they have a spurt of personal growth, you know, and post-traumatic growth is that people really growing as a result of kind of trauma and difficult experiences. You know, Jason, I guess you demonstrate that. You know, I think that's also really, really important to remember, you know, that it can be an opportunity, you know, for accelerated personal growth. Well, I, I've always used this example of the, the benefits that you get from, from digging in and doing that discovery if it's painful and it's, you know, a bit uncomfortable, is that there's a, a seed and they stay in the depth of 
and they need that darkness to be able to crack open. And then they've got to work their way all the way through the soil, grow as an actual plant before they bloom. There is a lot of under the surface work that happens with plants before you actually get that beautiful bloom part that we all want to take photos of. So that's how I just think it's, it's tough and it's difficult, but it's worth it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Joe, did you have anything to add? <laughs> You've pretty much covered everything. Just going based on what you said about, uh, well, Mark said about personal growth. It's kind of nice to have as much trauma as traumatic as ironically. You've got something to build off of, which is like, you know how to go in the right direction and you can learn from where you've been not to go back in that direction. Obviously with the right yeah. help and as you said before, about being the right person, not everyone's got the right person until you go through a few people. Myself, I've been through quite a few different therapists and I mean, we have to get the right one that kind of gets where I'm coming from and lets you just vent. Yeah, yeah, well, like, you know, like Mark and Jace, if you if you get that um, person, if they want to be more clinical about it, if you get someone who wants to be more spiritual about it, just go. It's your journey. I love what Jason said about being curious. Being curious in life is great. Sometimes I ask questions, people are like, why the hell would you even think that? Just delve, delve deep into it. It's fun. Just act like a kid again and you, you learn and you move forward and you can be more compassionate, I feel, as well. That's yeah and, and compassion to self you know also a big part of that you know and you yeah. know, also to, just to quickly just jump on something that jason said you know yeah i mean i feel the same about diagnosis you know i'm ambivalent yeah diagnosis can sometimes pathologize people and they kind of carry around this diagnosis for some people it's helpful you know for some people perhaps it's less help helpful but um and and also in terms of kind of the therapeutic modalities yeah i mean you know we all have different modalities and there's infighting within the therapy world and you know people have lists of qualifications you know but the research suggests it's all about the relationship it doesn't yeah. matter what someone's trained in particularly it's the relationship if you find somebody that you can work with and you have a really really good you know interpersonal relationship good dynamic with them that's what's healing yeah yeah great good well um yeah i think that that's something that yeah we're all in complete uh, agreement on is um, working with good people and in saying good people, I'm really grateful to both Mark and Jason for you guys to be able to be so open with us about what you've been through. Cause it is, you know, it's a tough subject um, to talk about. Um, and Joe, it's been good to have you on this side of the camera with me yeah. as opposed to <laughs> giving me all the, all the cues, like hurry this up. We've had unlimited time. <laughs> nice to finally join something good comes up this <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> Um, yeah. I just want to say thank you to both the guests. I um, finally got Mark on the podcast. He's been harassing me to try and get involved in the podcast. We finally found a way. <laughs> um, and obviously this is like the third project I've worked on with him now. Um, and Jason, it's been really interesting hearing your story and kind of you can almost write a book of all the stuff you've been through. And Yeah, I, I was yeah. like, yeah, can we, um, yeah just, just the end of my really, feet. Like, you've really been through it all. <laughs> it's on the way. It's coming. Yeah, just... Um, I feel like you're in a better place mentally now than obviously before. Yeah. Well, what I like as well um, with Jason is that I I would like to get into coaching or counselling or something like that down the track. And, you know, I'm trying to delve into all of my stuff now to obviously be better prepared to help people in the future. And at some, you know, as you were kind of doing your studies, you started helping people while while still working on yourself which i thought was really interesting and you said that it helped your your growth and see things differently as well yeah and if any of you guys are interested in what i do i've got a podcast called misunderstandings of the mind you know and it's it's um there's quite a lot of episodes on there i'm up to about 25 now with different people um you your link about... in, the, in in our comment or oh, like not in our in our description of the video, we'll, we'll put both of your um, details and stuff that you've mentioned into so other people can check you out yeah. on their journey. Yeah, we yeah. do have some of Mark's stuff on our website as well from previous work with him. So a lot of his yeah. links are on our website. So. Yeah, yeah. Love, love to check out your work. And I'm sure that there'll be people listening that will be like, oh, I want to hear more about <laughs> what Jason's up to. Um, mm. And, you know, I'm sure that there are people that can really uh, relate to, to what you've been through too. So yeah, that that's been really awesome. Joe will grab the details 
yeah, we'll yeah. put the links in the description. Um, yeah. yeah, just obviously check out Jason's podcast and Mark's doing a video thing on his YouTube channel called Psychotherapy Unfold. Um, hypersensitivity and a few other topics so we'll put that in the description as well and his website lots of resources yeah so many resources this time (laughs) yeah (laughs) well that's great thank you everyone um for your time it's been amazing chatting to you and uh we'll let you get on with the rest of your day yeah thank you thank you you. nice to meet you guys thanks very much Bye. Bye. bye bye so yeah um Thank you to everyone for joining the podcast. Um, our next episode, um, Jordan was going to mention but forgot, uh, it was OCD. So stay tuned and thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Yeah, thank you. I'm just sitting here I got time